because of various sessions. Learned faculty who will be delivering the orations, the opening, will be guiding the panel discussions, symposia, workshops, doctors from other disciplines, researchers, scientists, delegates, allied professionals. I, on behalf of JPEF, Joseph Davis Professional Education Forum, 2016 annual convention, cordially invite you all to this session. I am confident that the exchanges and interactions between the participants and of course the scientific sessions held during the two-day convention will be very useful to all of us. We, on behalf of the organizing committee, have made every effort to make your stay, two-day stay here comfortable your interaction and participation in this uh, annual convention purposeful and useful to all of us. And should there be any shortcomings, we have about 40, 40 volunteers around. You may contact them and we will ensure that your comfort level is always maintained. Once again, I welcome you all to this annual convention of Jodi Dev's Professional Education Forum 2016. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. First of all, let me thank Jodhya sir for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. The topic is classification and diagnosis of diabetes. And the speaker is none other than Dr. Arun Shankar. He's a senior consultant diabetologist and unit head at Jodhya Dev's Diabetic Research Center. Good morning. On behalf of uh, Jodhya Dev's Professional Education Forum, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome you once again uh, to this annual convention of this year. So my topic is classification and diagnosis of diabetes. I'll be going through the following headings and introduction, classification, pathogenesis, both type 1 and type 2, and the diagnosis. Diabetes mellitus uh, is a group of metabolic diseases, each characterized by chronic hyperglycemia at the background of uh, disturbances in metabolism of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And this hyperglycemia, the high level of blood glucose, can be either due to the defects in insulin production or insulin insensitivity, or it can be due to both. The present classification of diabetes is based on its etiology. So the type 1 diabetes mainly causing due to beta cell destruction, where we have absolute insulin deficiency, which occurs usually uh, due to autoimmune process and type 2 there is progressive loss of insulin secretion and there is beta cell decline at the background of insulin resistance and we have gestation diabetes which is uh, diabetes diagnosed during the mid pregnancy so majority of the diabetes usually uh, comes under the type 2 category and we have 5 to 10 percent uh, coming under type 1 and gen gestational diabetes the other rare categories include MODI, which is maturity onset diabetes of the young. It usually presents below the age of 25. And here uh, you have the defects in insulin secretion. Also, diabetes can result due to in, uh, inherited defects in insulin action. The antagonistic action of certain hormones can also result in diabetes, which occurs along with endocrine disorders like acromegaly, and Cushing syndrome. The disease specific to pancreas include uh, pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, cancer, and hemochromatosis. Drug-induced or chemical-induced diabetes usually occurs uh, while we use steroids, uh, thiazides, or pendamidine, and some chemotherapeutic agents and certain agents used in treating uh, HIV. Usual infective origin includes congenital rubella, coxsackie, cytomegalovirus, and mumps. And majority of type 1 diabetes, uh, the cause, again, it is due to organ-specific autoimmune response, which results in total destruction of beta cells. Uh, at the onset, you can see the presence of lymphocytic cells, which infiltrate in and around the beta cells of islets. And here, you get the auto antibodies to islet cell and insulin autoantibodies. 
the beta cell destruction is usually a progressive one in children and it is very slow among adults during the preclinical uh, phase of type 1 diabetes uh, that is the uh, time preceding the onset of type 1 diabetes you can detect the islet cell antibodies as markers and other immunological markers this is the pictorial representation of uh, the natural history of type 1 diabetes and these are the uh, markers which we see so usually uh, there, there are genetic influences children whose mother has type 1 diabetes has lower risk com when compared to uh, father with type 1 diabetes uh, genetic susceptibility is determined by HLA and other markers and coming on to the environmental factors you have certain viral infections they act as initiators or accelerators or they are the precipitators for the beta cell destruction which results in type 1 diabetes we have so many viruses associated with type 1 diabetes but uh, all of them who are getting infected with these viruses uh, doesn't develop uh, the disease there are no specific antiviral vaccines against this infection uh, endo enteroviral infection echovirus and uh, other environmental factor include early introduction of certain uh, products like casein cow's milk protein gluten etc other autoimmune disease associated with type 1 diabetes include graves disease thyroiditis of hashimoto addison's disease vitiligo so the people who have abnormal immune response develop antibodies uh, that damage beta cells which results in the total destruction of beta cells uh, resulting in absolute insulin deficiency during the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes the initial management with insulin results in a small amount of insulin being secreted from pancreatic beta cells which remains in the pancreas thereby the requirement of injected insulin is temporarily reduced which is known as the honeymoon period it can last up to one year or longer but ultimately due to the immunological destruction of pancreatic beta cells there is total destruction of beta cells resulting in insulin deficiency moving on to type 2 diabetes which is the most common form of diabetes and here uh, you have the insulin resistance but along with that you have the beta cell loss here also you can uh, see the progressive decline in beta cell which starts with functional abnormality so uh, the risk factors include ex excessive body fat like body mass index uh, obese individuals are more prone to insulin insensitivity or insulin resistance resulting in type 2 diabetes and usually it is asymptomatic initially so the diagnosis is very late and long standing high levels of blood glucose can result in uh, result in the usual complications of diabetes but at the same time the initial uh, phase of type 2 diabetes is asymptomatic and the beta cell decline progresses and uh, the patients will be symptomatic very late and you can see the uh, abnormal glucose fasting glucose and the second graph there is beta cell decline which is progressive one the landmark clinical trials like ukpds have shown that um, uh, about 50 percentage of patients who had uh, diagnosed already had complications due to diabetes uh, these type 2 diabetes patients have uh, relative insulin deficiency and also they have fatty liver associated with diabetes which again uh, can be diagnosed before the onset of diabetes or during the pre-diabetes phase multiple genes are associated with type 2 diabetes and in the early stage the insulin uh, insensitivity pancreas produces more insulin to overcome this insulin insensitivity there is hyper insulinemia again here also uh, the result is progressive uh, decline in beta cell poor fetal nutrition can result in uh, the onset of diabetes which is again caused due to the decreased beta cell formation and diabetes in later life and early exposure to high glucose levels in utero can also result in diabetes in later life the thrifty gene hypothesis humans usually genetically programmed to survive uh, uh, periods of calamities or famine but at times of abundance 
uh, that these genes contribute to excessive accumulation of uh, fatty tissue, which again uh, result in diabetes due to uh, sedentary lifestyle or excessive uh, fat intake or high energy diet in later life. Actually, in aging, we have the natural loss of beta cells. So, diabetes, type 2 diabetes is more common with aging. Obesity, uh, insulin insensitivity is more, which again increases the risk of type 2 diabetes in obese individuals. And along with uh, globalization or urbanization, the reduced li the changes in lifestyle with reduced physical activity and excess uh, calorie intake can also result in obesity, ultimately uh, resulting in type 2 diabetes. And we have the data like uh, type 2 diabetes being seen more in, among uh, kids or children due to again uh, decreased exercise or physical activity along with increased calorie and fat intake. The, so the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is increasing in children. So coming on to diagnosis, we have the oral glucose tolerance test which is more sensitive than fasting plasma glucose for diagnosing pre-diabetes but it is less convenient as we have to uh, take more samples after uh, going for the 75 gram glucose load. And these are the values, 140 to 199 uh, after 2 hours is considered pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, 200 milligram or above is considered as diabetes. Fasting plasma glucose is a usually preferred test which determines the glucose uh, performed overnight fasting and it is reliable when done in the morning. 99 and below is considered as normal, 100 to 125 is pre-diabetes, 126 or higher is considered as diabetes and if you get a value of 126 or, a, or above, it should be confirmed by repeating the test on another day. So the oral glucose tolerance test uh, is considered to be abnormal when it is along with the, the presenting symptoms of diabetes which includes excessive uh, urination, thirst, uh, weight loss and other common symptoms of diabetes. Random value, uh, the plasma, uh, the blood sugar checks without regard to your last meal. And we have the most uh, important test which is hemoglobin A1C, glycated hemoglobin, which, is, which can be used as a screening tool for uh, pre-diabetes as well as diabetes. Uh, it gives the idea of, of last uh, three, or three months time of blood glucose. And 5.7% uh, below is considered as uh, normal, 5.7 to 6.4 is pre-diabetes, 6.5 or above 6.5 is considered as diabetes. So uh, diagnosing diabetes along with symptoms and acting uh, as early as possible is important while considering the initial asymptomatic phase of diabetes and also the uh, landmarks trials and studies showing like pre-diabetes phase itself can result in uh, diabetes complications so that after diagnosing we can act properly and prevent the so-called complications that we see commonly in diabetes. Thank you. That is a wonderful presentation Dr. Arun. And now the topic is open for discussion. Uh, false positive HPA1C Sir, as rightly said, we, we can get false positive HPA1C, so definitely uh, you have to repeat the HPA1C test if it is abnormally high or low. Uh, we cannot confirm with single value of HPA1C. Like that, uh, fasting plasma glucose or two hours after food or random blood, blood glucose, if we get abnormal value, definitely you have to repeat the uh, test once more. And if it is along with symptoms, you have to consider it as abnormal. Type 1 and type 2, we have the markers which is uh, being discussed during the uh, talk like the immunological markers but uh, the pre-diabetes phase it is very difficult to uh, diagnose or get the symptoms and considering the risk factors like uh, we have type 1 diabetes among uh, twins or family history of type 1 diabetes. So, we cannot presume that it can go for type 1 diabetes. So if it is symptomatic only, we can go for the immunological markers uh, with abnormal blood sugars.